Join us now is Nikesh Arora, <clears throat> CEO of Cybersecurity, a giant Palo Alto. It is giant now, Palo Alto Networks, giant in, in market cap and everything else. Congrats. Four years uh, with stocks up uh, since you came on four times. Four and a half, but who's counting? Four and a half, but who's counting? <laughs> I mentioned earlier, it, it, you know, I love reading about molecular genetics, but I read about cybersecurity combined with AI, and I am left in a bit in a bit of a daze. But these are these are daunting times, but times that uh, the opportunity is like it's never been uh, in the past. I would imagine. Yeah, look, I think part of what is joy, if you look around you everywhere, everybody wants to deploy more and more technology into the enterprise. And the more technology you want to deploy, the more you're going to take a look at data, the more AI you want to do, the more data you're going to take and analyze. And in that process, you're going to leave a lot of doors open for bad actors to come right. and access your technology. If you look last year, billions of dollars were paid in ransomware, and we saw very few convictions. So if you're in the bad business, this is a good bad business to be in because there are a lot less people getting caught. So you're seeing that you know, the economic incentive is there for bad actors to get into these doors that are left open by companies who don't secure themselves well enough. There are new technologies in, in what you do, and you've made acquisitions bringing in companies that either augment or, or to somehow synergize your own offerings. What, which ones have you done recently? I, I, re I read about them, but I didn't understand exactly what, the, what I was reading. I think if you, if you look at a macro level, Joe, five years ago, uh, the trend in our industry was you came up with something new, something cool, you sold it to a lot of people, you became a hot cybersecurity stock, and then somebody else showed up because the bad actors moved on to something else. So in history, we've never had a cybersecurity company that has persisted or been evergreen. Uh, so the strategy we took on five years ago was that we want to be there where every trend shows up. We'll be there early. If you can't build it, we'll buy it. That sounds like a big pharma company. Uh, I hope not. The <laughs> difference is in pharma companies, you're solving very specific problems. You know, it's like you've no, solved cancer. but they cancer. buy their pipeline. Right. They do, they, but they, you know, they solve patient. cancer. There are people who have cancer. Right. They don't necessarily have something wrong with their eyes. So you don't need a medicine that works in Alzheimer's and a Parkinson's and cancer. But so how do you think business? about an R&D budget versus an acquisition budget, effectively? So we've been pretty consistent, being able to spend about five hundred million to a billion dollars a year, in addition to about twelve to fourteen percent of our spend being an R and D. So that seems to be the right balance. And every year there's about two thousand companies that get funded in the cybersecurity space. So it's an amazing innovation farm. You can go out and look at them. Do you I fear though that over time and the bigger you get and the better this works, that the government says, Well look, we can't have you buying all these companies. It's just it's too too much. Well, I think the, most of the things you bought are, are, are small enough that, that they're not to right. They're not they're not hitting Washington. But at some point, does Washington start to look at this and say, I think the question is, are we creating a better outcome for our customers or not? Are we helping customers secure themselves? Or are we going to end up in this chaos where customers are going to get breached and lots of money will be lost? So I think from that perspective, if we can take a deployed customer and add another feature to it by acquiring mm -hmm. a company, that's a much better outcome for customers. We're not destroying competition. Right. We're not making it hard for anybody else. We're just making sure that the needs of the customer and needs of the moment are met. So, so you, we started talking about AI. Is AI going to help you design security products well, for you know, customers? Or, or do you need, because of the proliferation of AI, do they need now more cybersecurity because of AI, it's yes, all and yes. yes and yes. Yes and yes, Look, I mean, literally, I just walked out of a meeting, there's 100 CEOs sitting there talking about how do we interpret generative AI and how do we make sure it, we can use it in our business. This is the fastest any technology trend has taken off. I can't remember any other time where, last year we weren't talking about generative AI at Davos, and today everybody's talking only about generative AI. So everybody's got religion, they all want to figure out a way of leveraging AI in their business. Now, the moment you do that, you're going to be sharing your company's data, your customer's data with some LLM out there. Everybody's trying to grapple with- Large uh, language how, model for those sorry, uninitiated. Models, yep. Yes. Sorry, we've talked about this so often. I know, I know. Yes. Letters. Yes. Yeah, yes. I know. And everybody's trying to, trying to figure out how to make sure the data stays secure. It doesn't get in the wrong hands. It doesn't, you, know, you don't have bad LLMs out there that are large language models <laughs> that are trained on bad data and get bad outcomes. Because but there, there is this tension between trying to protect your customers' data yes. and trying to make sure you are making the quickest advances possible with yes. AI. We've yes. watched that play out with OpenAI and Microsoft. Yes. How do you balance that? You know, uh, that's a great question. I think it's much easier for startups to go out because they have nothing to lose. Yeah. But if you take a large pharma company and they put all their intellectual property into a large language model and train it to figure out the next medicine, what if that model is open and somebody else starts training on the same model, suddenly your IP has been 
compromised, so, compromised and given exactly. away. Yeah. yeah. So that's why large companies with lots of data had to be more careful in trying to introduce new, new technology compared to startups with nothing to lose. Kesh, you, you and your CFO both said that market participants need to distinguish between billings and what was the other uh, it's RPO, RPO re yes. revenues, remaining per performance obligations. Okay, yes. so yes. It, initially the market looked and said uh, billings are are not what they're not up to snuff. You, I think that your CFO said, "Well, interest rates went up, so people that customers are not using the same purchasing. That's right. Um, I guess schedule that they would with lower rates." So what you really need to look at are our RPA, so our billings are fine. Can you just explain that? We're going to get into a technical discussion. Then? I don't know. We're, we're, uh, it was technical look, enough. It, it's very easy. You know, if you go, you buy this cup, you get revenue. You pay for it, that's yeah. revenue, right? Now in our business, we say, I promise to serve you for the next three years, right? The customer signs a contract, I promise to serve in the next three years. That promise is called a remaining performance obligation. I just say, remember GE with their power generation business. You remember that, Andrew? They had some kind of weird way of accounting for... But it's all it's all legit. It's, it's all, all perfectly yeah, fine. Everybody everybody does it like right. that. The only distinguish distinction is, you can only bill what you invoice. So if I don't invoice you with three years right now, it's not billing. It's a future obligation. And that now I have rates to serve have you. come back down, right. so billings so, are going back. Everything. So people don't want to pay right. you up front anymore because I can make so five percent of the bank. So growth is just as robust as you had forecast. I think so growth is it. robust. I think cybersecurity will be a theme for a while. Mm -hmm. I think the more we get technologically dependent as a society. Right. The more cybersecurity. How, how we need much is, is, do the um, the big software, the Microsofts of the world, represent a competitor to you? Because over time, one of the things that they're trying to do yes. is increasingly integrate their own technology yes. and, and their own security into these these uh, operating yes. systems and yes. the like. Yes. Should they be? Should they not be? I mean, by the way, there's a potential case in. Uh, well, there's a case against Google, there's cases against Microsoft, there may be a case against Apple about their their integration of various things. If the DOJ called you and said, should these uh, uh, OSs have security in them, would you say? Operating systems. Uh, operating systems, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Should these operating systems have, have security built into them, you would say what? Look, there's two part answer to that. One is yes, most things should be secured by design. Trying to throw a security blanket after the fact is always harder. If you're secured by design, your operating system doesn't allow you to mess with it, it's better. But by definition, because everything needs to work with each other, Every piece of technology needs to leave doors open for me to talk to it, or me as in one piece of technology to talk to the other piece of technology. So we're, we're sort of not associated with any one particular camp. We provide security that runs on every piece of technology right. that's out there. So to the extent some of these players are integrating into their stack, yes. If you're right. totally reliant on their stack, yes, they, they right. present a threat. You, you use a VPN here? You just, would you even touch the Wi-Fi in, this, in, this, in Davos? No. no. You would not use Wi-Fi? 5G, it's wonderful. You go straight to 5G because you think it's that much safer. Turning yeah. mine off right now. Okay. Yeah. It's a, no VPN? I don't know what the CNBC... Uh, I'm shutting it off right now. Do you do a VPN over your 5G? Yeah, if I use my computer, yes, I do. Palo Alto has a product called Prisma Access. We protect most companies out there. We use that as a tunnel to go access data.